to all of you at this point, 106 people who have entered the room. Uh, we have expectation or 230 people registered. So we assume we'll catch up with people. Um, the, this program is sponsored by the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, which is a group that's existed for about five, four or five years, uh, started originally with the help of Tom Hayden, unfortunately now no longer with us, um, and to try to get, make sure that the anniversaries of the anti-war movement are not lost in history. Um, we were discussing a 50th anniversary of May Day and decided that since we wanted to involve other nonviolent protest movements that we that maybe we should up move that in the calendar earlier into the fall before the election since there's a major discussion of what ought to happen at the time of the election if there's some effort to undermine its results so that's why we are here and we're very honored to both have a great working committee uh, and also participants, panelists. Each panelist, um, I should also say that we're co-sponsored by the SNCC Legacy Project. Uh, you can find their link on the information page that's under chat. And also uh, one of our speakers is from the SNCC Legacy Project. And I'll mention when I introduce her. Um, the uh, we are doing another webinar on Friday on Chicago Seven, the film that Netflix started showing a couple of days ago, um, with mostly good reviews, and it will involve some of the people who were defendants and involved in the trial. Uh, the link to that webinar is in the the top of the chat room. Um, the, uh, as you've seen probably on the note, originally we were going to go into breakout rooms. We can't do that because it turned out that webinar doesn't allow you to do breakout rooms. So instead we are gonna have a more conventional question and answer. At the end, you should use the Q and A function that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and that Q and A will be sorted through by Chuck McKinney and if Carol gets on, Carol Cullum. And they will ask the questions of the panelists. Uh, we will also in a week or so, and we'll let you know the exact times, there will be meetings, Zoom meetings with each of the speakers uh, where you'll have a chance to ask your questions directly of them and also discuss with them the topic that they're talking about. So by the problem of technology, we actually can offer you something that's that's much richer uh, in looking at, at those areas. Um, the, uh, so again, use the Q&A at the bottom. Um, the chat, we would like to keep for notices to each other. Uh, if you are familiar with Zoom, you know that at the bottom, first you click on chat and then at the bottom, you decide who the chat's going to. You can direct it to everybody or you can direct it to a particular person, a particular participant. You can see the participants in the uh, icon to the left of Q&A. So um, I think that's all of the introduction. Again, uh, the bios are in the information blog. Uh, it's the second item in the chat. Uh, so I won't go, I might say a second or two about people. Our first speaker uh, is uh, Zahara Simmons. Uh, and she has both SNCC history and American Friends Service Committee history. And as an old friend, um, we're very glad to have her starting us off, Zahara. Thank you, John. Yeah. Oh, what happened? You're fine. I'm, I'm getting feedback. Are you all hearing the feedback? Yeah, we're hearing you just fine. 
Okay, hopefully uh, everybody on this uh, webinar is at least somewhat familiar with the civil rights movement and that we used creative nonviolence and civil disobedience to change the Jim Crow laws and the violently enforced racial segregation policies that all African Americans and I lived under in the Southern United States from the early 20th century until the early 1970s. Why did we need a civil rights movement for African Americans in the US? We really have to go back to the end of the US Civil War from 1861 to 1865 and the period called the Reconstruction Era, which lasted from 1865 to 1877. The civil rights movement set out to end the segregationist laws on the books referred to as Jim Crow laws and the racist practices that they buttressed. Uh, and the Jim Crow laws began being legislated in the late 19th century. Uh, during Reconstruction, federal laws, the first 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 were passed that provided civil uh, citizenship and civil rights protections in the South for former enslaved persons. And next, of course, was the passage of the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, which gave black men the right to vote. Uh, of course, black men uh, with the support of black women uh, took advantage of this. And more than 2000 black men held office during this period from the local level all the way up to the US Senate. Uh, Black people organized conventions and all kinds of things to demand their rights. Uh, unfortunately, the former slave owners of the Democratic Party plus the Republicans who had tired of the expenditures and the placement of troops necessary to protect the rights of the freedmen and women sold out the black citizens during the compromise of 1877. Uh, and from that point on, uh, Black rights were taken away. Um, Blacks continued to fight for their rights for over 50 years before the movement we call the Civil Rights Movement gained enough momentum and numbers necessary to be a force too large and too well organized to be ignored. The movement achieved its greatest legislative gains in the 1960s uh, after years of protest and direct action. Through the use of nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience campaigns, the movement was able to secure many of the protections in federal law that were taken from us at the end of reconstruction. It took an organized movement to end the Jim Crow system. We had to break the Jim Crow laws of the states to end this system. We had to be organized and disciplined with well thought out goals and strategies. Nonviolent direct action was key to changing these draconian laws. The whites in power, including the governors, the state legislators, mayors, sheriffs, chief of police, county officials, the White Citizens Council, the Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist, or terrorist organizations were hell bent on preventing this from happening and worked in unison to halt and break the back of our movement. They had the law, they had the guns, they had the animus, the racial hatred, and a fierce determination to preserve white supremacy and their way of life. And this included killing us if need be. On our side, we had excellent leaders, known and unknown, and masses of committed people 
who were just as determined to end the reign of white supremacist terror under which we lived. For many, no sacrifice was too great. We put our bodies on the line. We had to demonstrate to the country and to the world how these racist laws under which we lived were the antithesis of what this government claimed it stood for in its founding documents and in what it preached to the world, that it was the defender of democracy, the defender of human rights across the globe, and that it operated under a one person, one vote credo. When we broke the Jim Crow laws, uh, the forces of the state and the vigilantes rushed to crush us, beating, jailing, dogs, horses, high powered water hoses were used against us as we peacefully assembled. The whole world was watching. The federal government was embarrassed. Finally, they had to step in and force the South through the passage of new civil rights laws to stop the reign of terror and adhere somewhat to the US Constitution. They also had to send in enforcers to carry out these new laws, federal marshals, federal registrars, et cetera. Things changed rapidly out after this. When I returned to Mississippi in 1973, after leaving uh, in 1966, I could hardly believe how rapidly things had changed. There were thousands of black people registered to vote, hundreds of black elected officials, including mayors, sheriffs, and others. Terror no longer stalked the lives of all blacks as it had when I had left seven years earlier. It took my breath away to see it. Ours was a planned movement. Our major campaigns from the sit-ins to the freedom rides to the voting rights campaigns were planned and well thought out. We had systems in place to help us after arrest. These included lawyers, bail funds, phone trees, allies in high places who would call their senators, Congress members, and even the White House on our behalf. We in SNCC had shortwave radios. Uh, we had the Watts line. You probably never heard of that, where we could call without any money using a code in an emergency. This connected you to the Atlanta office. And for those of us working in Mississippi, to the Jackson office. These Watts lines were lifelines and they were monitored 24 seven. Also everyone going on a march or a demonstration was trained in nonviolent direct action techniques. We did role plays in which we simulated the beatings and racist attacks. We learned how to protect our most vulnerable body parts and how not to fight back, no matter the provocation. These were an invaluable part of our training. Everyone had to take a pledge to be nonviolent during our demonstrations or civil disobedient actions. Those unable or unwilling to take the pledge were given some other assignment. For example, to work the phones, to be a spotter or a medic or a driver. What we can learn from the movement for now. Planning is essential when possible. I know that many of the marches and demonstrations that emerged all over the country after the killing of George Floyd and others have been spontaneous and seemingly not planned beforehand. But we've learned that in many cases, there were local organizations on the ground that took or attempted to take leadership. This is very important. It is clear that we do have groups who have been working for years on the issue of police brutality, the murders of black, brown and indigenous people, housing, voting and other issues that we all are concerned about. A number of these local regional groups have come together in coalitions uh, this is important. 
During the civil rights movement, we had several major organizations, CORE, SCLC, SNCC, and the oldest one of all, the NAACP. Uh, and on many occasions, these groups united to carry out a major campaign. For example, the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer Project operated under the banner of COFO, and it was made up of the big four, SNCC, CORE, SCLC, and the NAACP. And of course, there were other smaller organizations that supported COFO's work and had projects of their own during that eventual summer and beyond. But our goals had been agreed upon and our actions were coordinated. This led to our success. This in my view is crucial for our movement today. Uh, we so, must- Zahara, I'm sorry, we have to have oh. to move on. So, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. I mean, it's wonderful. And uh, you can see for many of us, the civil rights movement was our birthplace in terms of both organizing style and strategy politics. And that's why we wanted SNCC and the civil rights movement first. And I'm sorry to have cut you off. You'll have a okay. some time later, but okay. Um, okay. Uh, I was also, we did get the chat room working happily and somebody said, so who was the person spoke at the beginning that I am John McAuliffe, I'm the coordinator of the Vietnam, Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. So our second speaker is the origin point of this particular discussion. Uh, Jay Craven, who is a filmmaker and was one of the organizers of the People's Peace Treaty, which expressed itself in the May Day demonstrations. Jay, and there is a new book about May Day, which you should get by uh, Lauren, Larry Roberts. Jay. On April 29th, 1970, President Nixon intensified the Vietnam War by sending US troops into Cambodia. Protests rippled across college campuses on May 4th. Ohio National Guard troops opened fire against protesting students at Kent State, killing four and wounding nine more. Four million students responded, staging the largest national student strike in American history. 11 days later, police opened fire on African-American students at Jackson State College in Mississippi, who responded to false rumors that civil rights activist Charles Evers had been shot. Two students were killed, 12 were wounded. Students drew an unmistakable message from these shootings that law enforcement was upping the ante to thwart protest. The looming question, how could we up the ante nonviolently and effectively to push back and increase the cost to the government for illegitimate state violence and a racist war? Four days after the Kent shootings, 100,000 people marched on Washington, 150,000 mobilized in San Francisco. Many felt these actions fell short, were easy to contain, and did not make a difference. Longtime peace activist Dave Dellinger, fellow Chicago 7 conspiracy defendant Rennie Davis, and Arthur Waskow, the Institute for Policy Studies, started conversations that spring, culminating in a proposal for militant civil disobedience the following May to disrupt business as usual in Washington. They took their proposal to a regional peace gathering in Milwaukee in June 1970, where it was rejected as too ambitious. Davis and Dellinger then attended the August meeting of the United States National Student Association in McAllister College in Minnesota, where a thousand elected student leaders met to pass resolutions and mingle with speakers like Seymour Hirsch, who broke the explosive My Lai massacre story and civil rights icon, Fannie Lou Hamer. I was at the NSA conference representing Boston University. After hours of intense debate, we narrowly passed a call for May Day 1971 civil disobedience action in Washington. Then conservative students used parliamentary moves for a revote. Our resolution failed by four votes. A more moderate call passed for protests that might include civil disobedience if Nixon didn't end the war. Then another resolution surfaced from the South Vietnamese Student Union for a meeting of student leaders from South Vietnam, North Vietnam, the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, and the US to draw up a people's peace treaty on terms to end the war. The resolution passed. Dave Dellinger and Rennie Davis took the NSA resolutions to advance their call for civil disobedience. 
Rennie's slogan soon emerged. If the government won't stop the war, we'll stop the government. Not everyone signed on. In his memoir, Tom Hayden termed the May Day call apocalyptic. I spoke in support of May Day at the NSA conference. That fall, I was called to meet with Rennie and Dave in Washington. They asked me to join the NSA's People Peace Treaty delegation to North and South Vietnam. We want you to go, Dave said, drinking Kentucky bourbon and smoking a contraband Cuban cigar. <laughs> when you return, we expect you'll give all you've got for May Day. I was frankly scared. I harbored some conventional political ambitions and knew that a trip to Hanoi and May Day would end those. But this seemed to be the right thing to do. So I went to Vietnam, traveled to more than 100 colleges and community, community meetings across the country to help mobilize civil disobedience in Washington. Civil disobedience was pivotal, pivotal to the civil rights movement and against the war. During the Vietnam era, some 500,000 young men resisted the draft. 210,000 were formally charged. As many as 100,000 moved to Canada and other countries. More than 500,000 US soldiers deserted the army during the Vietnam era, taking refuge in Sweden and other countries. In the tradition of writer Henry David Thoreau, who refused to pay taxes to protest slavery, and the American War Against Mexico, there was also tax resistance to the Vietnam War by more than 20,000 people. Protesters staged, staged sit-ins to block troop trains, ROTC programs, and defense contractors like Dow Chemical that made napalm, the self-igniting jellied gasoline dropped from US aircraft to incinerate thatched houses and burn human flesh. In 1967, 50,000 protesters marched on the Pentagon, 700 were arrested. The Yippies staged guerrilla theater that skirted the law and created disruption. Radical clergy raided, raided draft boards and destroyed records. Activists picked locks and broke into the media Pennsylvania FBI office, seizing documents that uncovered the FBI's massive COINTEL program of surveillance, infiltration, and disruption of American activist groups. Despite all this, the war continued. May Day promised to increase the pressure. Some new ideas at the time shaped May Day strategy. First, we made a specific and urgent case against the war. The title of our 16 millimeter film used for organizing, Time is Running Out, said it all. We looked past Bring the Boys Home to a militant opposition to what we saw as criminal US policy that included massive air war terrifying anti-personnel bombs that targeted civilians, routine search and destroy missions like the Milan massacre that returning vets described, the use of the tiger cages and torture against Saigon dissidents, rampant assassinations from the Operation Phoenix program, and the use of highly toxic Agent Orange chemicals to defoliate forests and crops, causing birth defects among Vietnamese children. The, FB, the February 1971 US invasion in Laos further expanded Nixon's war and added to the urgency we articulated. Another innovation for May Day, organizing went beyond the simple call to march and rally. Local organizers brought in a speaker or showed the May Day film, but these activists took it from there to organize their own region down to affinity groups between four and 15 people who planned a range of civil disobedience actions in specific locations that were outlined and photographed and mapped in, de in a detailed tactical manual that was also created by and distributed by the DC office of the Mayday tribe. Local activists mobilized their own regions, designed their own actions, staged civil disobedience training and planned logistics, housing, food and communication for multiple days of actions, including contingencies if members were arrested. May Day actions involved various groups and tactics. Traditional peace activists staged very cool sit-ins. Others mounted mobile hit and run disruptions while remaining nonviolent, where they could tie up one street, then sprint off to tie up another area before police could stop them. A new generation of college students came ready to risk arrest. Some 35,000 people descended on Washington to disrupt business as usual. African-American activists who did not join May Day actions by mostly white activists quickly mobilized crucial food, water, and blankets for arrested protesters. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the National Welfare Rights Organization did field protesters, especially during the People's Lobby we staged the week before where hundreds were arrested in the halls of selected service Justice Department, Health Education and Welfare, and others. 
the White House went into full crisis mode, ordering Washington 7,000 police and 10,000 military troops to full alert. Investigative writer Lawrence Roberts provides excellent detail and drama on all of this in his important new book, May Day, 1971. May Day actions directly followed Vietnam Veterans Against the Wars, Dewey Canyon III, where vets threw combat, combat medals onto the steps of Congress, and an April 24th DC march of 500,000 people. Partnerships like this were also new. On Monday, October, on Monday, May 3rd, after being routed by police from our campground in West Potomac Park the day before, May Day demonstrators appeared as planned, stringing cables, pushing junk cars, or locking arms across key streets to obstruct the normal functioning of government. Some government workers were ordered to show up at 3 a.m. to reduce traffic, but police were taxed to the max, rushing and dispersing tear gas from one spot to another. By 8 a.m., the Justice Department called for troops and five huge Chinook military helicopters landed at the Washington Monument, disgorging hundreds of armed and helmeted soldiers to block our protest. The city was under siege. Police suspended normal rules of arrest to create a dragnet of the entire city where they grabbed anyone looking suspect. We overflowed the jails and RFK Stadium was turned into a prison camp complete with poor conditions, incidents of police violence, and a spirit of resistance that made clear our determination. On day two, Tuesday, 5,000 demonstrators converged on the Justice Department to demand the release of May Day protesters. Police surrounded us and moved in. More than 2,000 were arrested. On day three, thousands more converged on the Capitol, invited by progressive congressmen Bella Abzug and Ron Dellums, who was billy clubbed by a cop. We demanded ratification of the People's Peace Treaty. More than, a hundred, more than a thousand were arrested. More than 12,000 men and women were arrested at May Day, making it the largest mass arrest and civil disobedience action in US history. Um, the most, there's always a comparison of which manifestation of public protest was larger and more diverse and widespread. Um, and it's pointless because each speaks to the moment of history. Uh, and each of the ones represented today had historic impact. Black Lives Matter and the results of the deaths of, of and serious injuring of both black men and women has turned over American society in many ways and echoing the civil rights movement uh, 50 years ago. Um, our speaker next is Shahida Jones, who's active in the leadership of Black Lives Matter in Tennessee, and is also unfortunately a victim of the plague of the COVID virus. And so we'll have, if she is choking, it's not just a motion of her words, but also <laughs> fighting off that, Shahida. Thank you. Yes, and you, uh, not sure if you know, you cannot catch it through Zoom. Just to <laughs> Folks, now give me just a second. Brain fog is also a thing, and so I had to create a presentation. So give me a second to share my screen. Okay. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, cool. So uh, just a little bit of history. I'm not sure if folks know how Black Lives Matter got started, but initially um, the term or the phrase that it, it'd been used sparingly before, but the start of our history starts with a list, uh, love letter posted to Facebook by founder Alicia Garza in the wake of Trayvon Martin's murder and the subsequent acquittal of his murder in 2013. Um, it was a longer letter but she ended with the words, we don't deserve to be killed with impunity. We need to love ourselves and fight for a world where black lives matter. Pe black people, I love you. I love us. We matter. Our lives matter. And then her friend, activist Patrice Colors, shared the note with using the hashtag Black Lives Matter on Twitter. Alicia uh, was not very familiar, not very active. And then it got shared widely from that point. Um, after the success of the hashtag, 
Their fellow activist and friend, Opal Tometi, created both a website and a social media platform, and they launched what was initially a project of just bringing folks together. Um, a year later, Ferguson, the killing of Mike, the murder of Mike Brown, and the Ferguson uprisings happened, and most of that, uh, the majority of that uprising was led by local activists and people on the ground. But Patrice Colors, um, a founder of Black Lives Matter and Darnell Moore or, uh, organized Black Lives Matter Ride in support of Ferguson. Um, and lots of organizers from around the country came down to support the uprisings. And, and many of them left that motivated and politicized, as we say, to form what is now the Black Lives Matter Global Network of over 40 chapters. And recently uh, the launch of a foundation that is separate from a chapter structure. Our Memphis chapter, of which I'm a member of the coordinating committee here, was founded in 2015. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that has happened and a lot of critiques of Black Lives Matter. And I think one of the things that's been, before we get into the how we use civil disobedience, I wanna really talk about um, one, of, one of the things that I think has been one of the most ongoing and lingering concerns is this trap of this belief of a peaceful protest. And the reason I say that is not because there's never a time when Black Lives Matter, uh, people who both organize under the banner or people who lead chapters, and those are separate things, um, are not actively intending. But what we notice about peaceful protests is that the onus is often on the protesters and um, that the lack of peace is also often seen and credited to the protesters. And so with that in mind, I thought about uh, several, uh, I brought up several quotes from people and many of, the, many of them you've probably heard, but I want you to think about how they are still relevant um, directly in the critique that we hear about Black Lives Matter and the style of protest we use now. And also noting that, um, you know, there is no perfect protest. And so we'll get into more of that later. So one of the first mm -hmm. ones is the, uh, was a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. in the letter from Birmingham jail, which talks about um, the conclusion that the great stumbling block and stride towards freedom is not the white citizens counselors or the Ku Klux Klaners, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goals that you seek, but I can't agree with your method of direct, direct actions. You guys can read the rest of that, but one of the things that we still notice today is that it's we have identified who our opposition is. So we're not talking about the critique. The critique from what is identified as opposition is not necessarily what's in question here. It is still consistently people who have identified themselves as allies, who also then provide the critique and push the narrative that how we have chosen to go about fighting for our freedom in this moment is somehow too much, too far. And it is the exact same critique um, that we see that the civil rights movement folks experienced back then. But often people will use the civil rights movement as this, as this mantra, as this uh, um, goal, right? As if there was perfection in it, as if there were never times when people disagreed, as if everything that happened under the banner of civil rights was supported and that there wasn't pushback in that time. And it's like, hey, why can't you be more like this when the reality is, what is true and consistent is what's most consistent is the same critique of the way that folks fight for, for their freedom. And so that's what my note says, that again, the onus, uh, the observation is that the onus of uh, this is often put on Black Lives Matter, the protesters, and peacefulness is never, we never talk about the state. We never talk about how the responsibility of this state to respond to us and the experience of protesters who are actively being, pro, you know, being surveilled. We never get to that. Um, this also talks, this is another quote from Stokely Carmichael, 
who talks about the significance of the use of the black power theme um, and, and why it was important for them to use such strong language. Again, we received the same pushback around the use of Black Lives Matter that we see Stokely has removed, has, uh, Stokely and SNCC received uh, in response to the use of Black power. And we agree that an organization which claims to be working for the needs of the community must work to provide that community with a position of strength from which it makes its voice heard. This is the significance of the black power and beyond the slogan, power beyond the slogan. And that's similar to how we feel about Black Lives Matter. The last thing on this is the question uh, is from F. Fannie Lou Hamer. I question America and this America the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hook because our lives are threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Again, when we talk about peacefulness, very rarely does we do we talk about the lives of activists who are surveilled, who deal with death threats, who are locked out of the economic opportunities of America as a result of protests. These things are still very much relevant and active today. Um, and so then we get into what is civil disobedience, right? And there's a difference between protest and civil disobedience. Protest can be any form, right? Protest can be any way that you raise your voice and believe, you know, and show how you feel, right? But civil disobedience is a very specific thing. And what's very specific about it is that it is about breaking the law. Right? It's about pushing back against the unfairness of laws. And so considering that often the critique of civil disobedience tactics is that, oh, you broke the law, so we're going too far. That's to me the irony of that, right? Like that is exactly the purpose of why we're doing that, is to show the unjustness of that. And so I wanted to highlight that. These are protest pictures taken from the uh, bridge shutdown in Memphis in 2016. So as I go through this, this is what you're seeing. Um, so BLM use of civil disobedience and protest. So how do we use, how has BLM used it? Shutdowns, we love to shut shit down. Sorry, we do. Um, highways, businesses, streets, political events, marches without permits, occupations, die-ins on people's lawns, shut it down. Um, media, Twitter storms, Zoom bombs, taking over Facebook comments, overloading phone lines, emails, cultural, in the midst of all of these things, sing-ins, murals, banner drops, songs, poems, flash mobs, decorating statues. Some people call it vandalism, we call it decorations. Same thing, but there's a direct purpose behind it. It's to bring awareness, it's to push people to think about things in a different way. Um, and so these are some of the ways that we use that. Some of the obstacles and misconceptions that we battle is that there is no strategy or planning behind our protests. That's a lie. We train folks, we believe in a leaderless movement. And so therefore we have specifically trained folks on how to do these things. And it doesn't mean that we've trained, like so many people jump are politicized after, but have been instructed that our protest is, uh, or our protest uh, is the only way that we do work and it's our only strategy. It's not true. Um, and that we aren't clear on what we want. And I think if you go to the movement for Black Lives, you can see our platforms, you can see clearly what we're working for and demand. You can see the Breathe Act, which is one of our current pieces of legislation. And I just want to name that there's no perfect protest or no right way to protest or do civil disobedience. And that's the end. That's great. Thank you very much. This is all of the presentations have been just extraordinary. Um, we often, uh, we're actually going a little further back in history at this point um, in a struggle that so much established itself uh, in terms of the right to vote before any of us were born, or I think any of us were born, that the extent to which that basic fundamental right involved active civil disobedience has been lost to history to many people and then took different forms in the later women's movement and in the effort to assure gender treatment, uh, equal treatment and fairness. 
uh, Sarah Matheson will be presenting on this topic, Sarah. Hey everyone, um, thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be with all of you and be speaking with such amazing uh, speakers and activists. Um, as I was thinking about preparing remarks for today, um, I was asked to speak about the role of civil disobedience in movements for gender and sexual liberation. Um, my mind sort of went to some current themes around the pandemic and particularly uh, how visible the role of caring labor has really become in mainstream conversations uh, about the quote unquote necessary essential worker who is also abandoned and not protected in any way, um, as well as the horrifying mismanagement of the pandemic in the US. And so two things that came to mind um, as topics that I wanted to talk about. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna try to share this. Um, I wanted to talk on the one hand about one movement that really brought um, reproductive labor and the work of caring labor into public visibility in the mid 1960s and that is the National Welfare Rights Organization and how civil disobedience factored in that movement. Um, and then I also am going to talk a little bit about the AIDS coalition to up, um, unleash power, the ACT UP response to the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s. Um, and what I had in mind in thinking about both of these movements is something that I think is talked about less when we're having conversations about strategizing and tactical decision making in relation to civil disobedience. And that is the necessity of participants in these movements to overcome um, the stigmatizing and shame inducing narratives that tell people that the conditions that are not of their own making are in fact their own fault and that they are responsible for um, the constraints on their lives. And you see that in different ways in both the NWRO movement and um, the direct action AIDS movement. So the National Welfare Rights Organization um, is really a movement of poor welfare mothers, predominantly black mothers who basically come together to say that the horrific treatment that they receive from welfare caseworkers, the uh, insufficient payments that they receive, uh, particularly in southern states, the longstanding racist and sexist treatment that is grant is put towards welfare um, mothers, including invasive uh, visits to their home by caseworkers, that none of that um, is that they deserve none of this treatment just because they are receiving welfare and in fact that their work as mothers uh, is deserving of a living wage and so the national welfare rights organization brings together um, participants from the civil rights movement movement for poor people right poor people's rights and a movement for women's rights, um, particularly mother's rights, and comes together around the goal of um, a guaranteed minimum income as kind of the major goal. But on the way to that goal, there are a number of um, smaller actions in cities across the country. So um, one example is that on June 30th in 1966, 6,000 women and children in 25 cities across the country um, swarm government, office, government offices of all sorts. Um, and this is demanding higher welfare payments, dem some demanding job trainings, uh, demanding food stamps, demanding per, um, grants for clothing for their children, demanding the basic necessities that they are entitled to as caretakers of their families. Um, 
it might, 6,000 might seem like a small number to some of us, but this action on June 30th comprises the largest coordinated national action of poor mothers um, since housewife councils had staged boycotts to lower staple food prices during the Great Depression. And the movement is really significant because, not only because of the um, way that it moves a number of women into direct action organizing, but also because of the way that it is able to cast off the st stigma and shame afforded uh, particularly Black welfare mothers and to say, actually, this is not, we are not responsible for these conditions. We are placing accountability at the feet of government officials. We refuse to be blamed any further for our circumstances. Um, it also, so I think that's really important because it changes the NWRO did a lot to change the conception of welfare mothers in the mind of the public. Um, and that in itself was a tremendous feat given how negative the stereotypes and denigration of welfare mothers was during this period and of course continues um, well into the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it also helped people to see that what women were doing within the home and with their families was valuable labor in and of itself. It wasn't that welfare was a handout given to lazy mothers, but actually what they were doing was valuable work that deserved a wage. So Beulah Sanders, who was a dynamite organizer in New York City said, quote, is it fair to call a woman lazy who stays at home, cooks, washes, irons, cleans house, teaches her kids how to do things and helps them with their homework? If she does the same work for somebody else for $2 or less an hour, is she really a better woman? You tell me. Let's remember two things. Seven million children need a few million people to look after them. And for most of those children, their mother is the best and only available person. So it was also, part of what the movement is doing is also asserting um, Black women's right to stay in their own home and raise their own children as opposed to being coerced and forced into the homes of white middle class um, people to take care of their children as poorly paid domestics. And that was another major critique that's embedded in the organizing that the NWRO did. Um, I wanted to just mention one other action that I think was really powerful because Beulah Sanders in particular was very talented at building coalitions across race and class lines. Um, and I think solidarity and coalition building is another vital tactic as people attempt to partake in what are incredibly, can be quite risky actions. Um, so in New York City in 1969, Sanders had convinced around 300 social workers to join the efforts of welfare mothers. They staged a walkout of a national social work conference, um, marched down 7th Avenue to the Sears and Roebuck and made a display of cutting up their Sears credit cards to protest Sears longstanding and institutional practice of denying welfare mothers credit. Um, at the same time, members of the New York City Welfare Rights Organization citywide also marched into Sears and started applying for credit and ordering clothes and furniture. Um, and this action was actually rather successful in that by the end of that year, multiple department stores had stopped the practice of denying welfare mothers credit. Um, and I think another pictured on the screen is uh, the first chair of the NWRO, Johnny Tillman. Um, and she has a really important quote that I think gets at the role of the necessity of overcoming um, or going through a process of personal politicization to understand that um, you are actually fighting a system that has created constraints on your life as opposed to being told that you are individually responsible for those conditions. Tillman says, quote, 
as, as we organized, we forgot about shame. And as we listened to the horrible treatment and conditions all over the country, we could begin thinking that maybe it wasn't us who should be ashamed, unquote. Um, I'm gonna scroll down so I can see Brewster's time uh, cards. So that's one, oh yeah. Thank you. So very quickly, I will now talk about ACT UP because I have one minute. And that is, um, I just want to mention a protest that ACT UP staged at Trump Tower in 1989. The ACT UP Housing Coalition um, was protesting the fact that Trump had received a 6.2 million tax abatement to construct construct Trump Tower in the midst of the AIDS epidemic as the number of homeless people living with AIDS was on the rise by 1989. 10,000 people had HIV. Many of them in New York City were homeless um, and ACT UP was targeting the injustice and unfairness of the city investing in a private real estate developer like Trump as opposed to addressing um, what by this time had been a full-blown crisis in the U.S. For a number of years, Reagan infamously refused to even utter the word AIDS publicly until six and a half years into the epidemic. And so ACT UP took immense, was an immense display of force in rejecting the narrative that um, gays were responsible for the epidemic, that the epidemic was somehow a curse um, as a or a result of their homosexuality, which conservative strategist Pat Buchanan helped to proliferate that argument. Um, and so I just wanted to draw our attention to a couple of movements that were able to turn really powerful stigmatizing and shaming um, narratives from the powers at B into political action to demand that the state actually take care of them rather than abandon and denigrate them. I'm happy to answer more questions about that in the Q&A and I'll stop there because I think I'm probably- Yes. Not Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, at, each of the speakers deserved a half an hour at least, maybe an hour and Dilemma is always breadth versus focus. Hopefully the follow on meetings will provide an opportunity to address some of these. So another part of our cultural and social history and political history that is not often thought about in terms of uh, the nonviolence and civil disobedience parts of it is the labor movement. Then, Kent Wong from UCLA will talk about that, Kent. Great, uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us today for the participants and it's really an honor to be on this uh, panel uh, of uh, uh, speakers addressing the power of nonviolence in various spheres of movement building and in uh, the broader movement for social justice. And uh, my perspective will specifically tie in the role of the labor movement and how nonviolence has been a, a strong uh, philosophy uh, that has been reflected in various uh, labor movements over the years. Um, I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center where I teach a course on nonviolence and social movements with Reverend Jim Lawson. Um, but uh, uh, prior to coming to UCLA, I worked as staff attorney for the Service Employees International Union here in Los Angeles that was at the forefront of a major campaigns that embraced nonviolence and advanced social justice unionism. But my beginnings in the labor movement were as a boycott organizer for the United Farm Workers of America under the leadership of Cesar Chavez. And um, uh, I think that uh, in terms of the contemporary labor movement, the United Farm Workers played a historic role in uh, advancing the philosophy of nonviolence and in using it in creative ways to build power for farm workers and to challenge uh, the abuse uh, of farm workers, uh, not only here in California, but throughout the country. And um, the farm workers very much under the leadership of Cesar Chavez and uh, Dolores Huerta, who just turned 90 years old and is still on the front lines fighting every day. Um, but uh, they very much popularized the philosophy of nonviolence through the grape boycott. They saw that this was a critical way to change the balance of power that existed in the fields of California, where you had a, a group of largely undocumented um, immigrant workers uh, who were um, living in company housing, who were 
faced with substandard working conditions, wages, and uh, housing, uh, and were being poisoned by pesticides in the fields. Um, and so it was through looking at the broader power dynamics that nonviolence was embraced as a way of uh, mobilizing broad-based public support for the farm workers movement through uh, the great boycott, uh, through the use of hunger strikes, through the use of pilgrimages on foot uh, throughout the Central Valley for hundreds of miles as a rallying call and a way of calling attention to uh, the abuse of the farm workers in the Central Valley, uh, through political mobilization, through mobilizing uh, uh, volunteer students on campuses across the country who joined the great boycott and who pledged to keep uh, non-union grapes off their campuses and uh, out of their communities. So in many ways, um, the movement of the farm workers was a reflection of uh, the power of nonviolence within the labor context. Um, when I was a staff attorney for the Service Employees Union, there were uh, two major breakthrough campaigns here in California that also popularized the use of nonviolence. And one was the Justice for Janitors campaign. I just published a book uh, on my, uh, the work of my good friend, Mike Garcia, who was leader of the Justice for Janitors for 20 years. Uh, he uh, tragically passed away a few years ago, uh, but I'm so thrilled that this book really honors his legacy and uh, also highlights uh, the impact of nonviolence and the creative use of nonviolence through the janitors uh, movement. Um, this year marks the 30th anniversary of a brutal beating of the Justice for Janitors in Century City, Los Angeles at the hands of the police. Uh, dozens of protesters were uh, attacked uh, during a peaceful protest by the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, dozens more were injured by the uh, attacks that they suffered. Dozens were jailed and one woman suffered a miscarriage at the hands of the Los Angeles Police Department for, uh, for um, her uh, role in, in protesting uh, peacefully. Uh, the janitors movement uh, swept throughout Los Angeles, throughout California and across the country. And once again, they used some very uh, popular direct action confrontation te uh, techniques, including uh, uh, sit downs, including uh, civil disobedience actions, including uh, blocking major intersections in downtown Los Angeles during rush hour to bring attention to the uh, uh, subhuman treatment of janitors. And in the year 2000, um, they launched a massive strike in downtown Los Angeles and in Century City that uh, paralyzed the city and attracted a huge support from uh, the public to uh, the janitors. Uh, the Justice for Janitors has successfully reorganized uh, the janitorial industry uh, throughout um, Los Angeles and California and has uh, brought today um, more significantly a new generation of uh, immigrant workers who are now uh, brought, have been brought into the labor movement. And um, I'm so glad that uh, uh, our earlier uh, uh, presenter talked about the power of May Day. Uh, Jay talked about the May Day back in 1971. Actually, the largest May Day in uh, US history uh, was in 2006, led by immigrant workers throughout the country. Millions and millions of immigrant workers uh, protesting the draconian anti-immigrant racist laws that were being uh, pushed through the uh, House of Representatives. And um, that May Day march back in 2006 was the closest thing that I've ever seen to a uh, general strike. Um, so um, um, I did want to, you know, just flag, uh, you know, two resources that for those who are interested in reading uh, more about uh, the role of nonviolence within um, uh, the labor movement. Um, one is um, a book that uh, um, was uh, published uh, with my good friend, uh, Reverend Jim Lawson, Nonviolence and Social Movements, the Teachings of Reverend uh, James Lawson Jr. And um, uh, this highlights five major nonviolent uh, movements of the 20th century from the uh, Montgomery bus boycott to the Nashville sit-in movement where uh, Reverend Lawson recruited uh, uh, John Lewis when he was a college student uh, in, um, in uh, Tennessee um, to uh, the uh, great boycott of the United Farm Workers to the immigrant worker organizing campaigns of Los Angeles and finally to the DREAM Act movement led by undocumented immigrant youth and uh, the most recent publication is Mike Garcia and the Justice for Janitors Movement, 
uh, which highlights uh, a one of the most successful labor uh, uh, organizing victories in decades that has successfully reorganized the janitorial industry. And uh, what was even more significant is that they uh, moved forward after successfully reorganizing uh, the janitorial industry uh, in a uh, show of uh, black brown solidarity, the largely uh, Latino immigrant uh, janitors movement uh, targeted a group of African-American security officers who worked for the very same multinational corporations. And this resulted in one of the largest African-American union organizing campaign victories in decades with the security um, organizing campaign. And so the power today is you go to the, uh, the justice for janitors and security officers uh, 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 union meetings and you have uh, Latina and Latino uh, janitors who don't speak English and you have African-American security officers who don't, don't speak Spanish, but they both uh, speak the language of justice and they both build solidarity uh, for uh, a common uh, worker solidarity interest uh, and uh, against common enemies. So um, uh, if either of you are interested in, uh, in either of these publications, please uh, check out the UCLA Labor Center uh, website and we would be happy to uh, send them to you. But thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to uh, speak uh, before uh, this uh, gathering. And we really hope that in the critical period ahead, when we have a, uh, a, uh, a, a racist, uh, a, a nihilist in the White House who is threatening not to uh, uh, obey the uh, results of the election, uh, that uh, we can use creative nonviolence in uh, building a, a broad-based mass movement to make sure uh, that the will of the people is respected and that Donald uh, Trump is uh, pushed out of office. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, the uh, resources that we've identified and some provided by the speakers are available in our blog page and I'll put that on, it's the top of the chat list, but I'll put it on again. Um, and it in includes some additional dimensions the things that you haven't haven't been able to be fit into the presentations here. So I hope you have a chance to look at them. Um, we have one last presentation on that's looking retrospectively, um, although it has much to do with the current situation also, um, which is the environmental movement and Georgia Hursty is an activist with Greenpeace, Georgia. Uh, hi everybody, thanks so much for having me. I just wanted to take this time actually to talk a little bit more about some of what the, we've done in the environmental movement over the years, but because a lot of that tactic wise I think has been covered, focus a little more on a couple examples, the kind of slightly different type of direct action that involves equi equipment and also talk about the power of direct action training right now, why we should keep using it and how it kind of bring people's along, brings people along. I wanted to start with really naming that there's of course no prescription or ownership or one size fits all when we talk about these tactics and what's true for one group or individual doesn't necessarily translate. And one of the things that I think has also been really important for me and in, in the uh, kind of movements around civil disobedience and, and direct action is the idea of, of nonviolence, how we talk about it and how in our training and um, in my perspective, what's happening now to really hold this idea of peaceful protest and nonviolence next to the ways that it's been used to continue to repress and suppress freedom fighters around the world. Um, and as a way of really controlling the narrative and who is committing the violence, um, which is predominantly the state and, and capitalism. And so how do we, how do we understand uh, direct action and civil disobedience as a tactic and also recognize righteous anger in these moments of, of, of freedom fighting as we move into a new era? So kind of in that context, um, direct action of course has been used widely throughout the environmental movement. Uh, the way that I came up and um, came from the lessons and learnings and traditions from direct action from generations of struggle before around justice, standing on the shoulders of giants. And right now in the last few decades, we've seen a lot of civil disobedience and direct action 
in the form of strikes and walkouts in citizens demanding urgent movement around climate change. We've also seen direct action and civil disobedience kind of shift from the environmentalism of the 70s, which was white and affluent, much more into a dominant lens of environmental justice that really focuses on following the voices and the leadership of the most impacted communities and the mar most marginalized folks. We've seen a lot of tactics where people put their bodies between the thing that they're trying to protect uh, and the person or machine that's putting at risk. The last couple of decades, particularly uh, with the direct action campaigning to stop oil pipelines from Keystone at Excel to direct uh, to Dakota, the Dakota Access Pipeline. These campaigns really utilizing the full range of direct action tactics like blocking roads, occupying spaces, stopping equipment by attaching your body to it with different pieces of gear. All of these are examples of direct actions that are both personal and collective that aim to stop something from happening in the moment, which I think is an important attribute but have much longer and deeper impacts for both the campaign objectives and the people involved. And we've talked a little bit about training, but I think for me, one of the thing that the one of the things that the kind of profound history of direct action has taught us is that the process is just as, if not more important than the moment of the action itself because it requires us to go really deep into ourselves and what our hopes are for a better world. And and when a person considers taking direct action, whether it's as an individual or part of a new team or part of their community, they have to go through a, a process of pushing all of the doubts and the narratives out of their heads around what society tells them is wrong, the proper way to behave. And they have to replace that with the truth of their own empowerment. And that is a transition that I think uh, we should really focus on and continue to focus on as our movements move through this particular moment in time, and I think is one of the most important pieces of direct action and civil disobedience. And more than that, each time someone who is taught that they are somehow incapable then wields a welding torch or gets off the ground in a harness or uses their wheelchair as a blockades device or stands in front of a police officer willingly makes someone uncomfortable each time a person refuses to be silenced or take back the space that they deserve, it gets us closer to this world that we're trying to build. I think one of the ways that civil disobedience and direct action, that this is one of the ways that civil disobedience, direct action, this movement right now is strengthening our communities and movements. And it is also important to recognize the huge amounts of risk that people are taking across movements, folks being targeted, arrested, beaten, threatened with slap suits. We see critical infrastructure laws all over the country right now that are continuing to stalk and abuse activists. And of course, the continuation of state sanctioned violence against people specifically fighting for social and environmental justice. The one action I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is a, is a little bit um, dated, but from in 2015, Greenpeace and a number of other groups were working on a campaign to prevent drilling in the Arctic. There was a ship called the Fenica that was carrying a mission critical piece of equipment needed to begin drilling and that sh in the Arctic and the, that ship had run aground. So it was getting emergency repairs in, in Portland. The St. John Bridge was in between the ship and the Arctic. So we found ourselves in this moment where there was a strategic choke point and the action was an aerial blockade. So we had climbers that could span the length of the bridge camped out on ropes that would make it so that the ship couldn't pass underneath. The campaign was called the People versus Shell. And while this was a moment of like of a very technical action, it was one action of many actions throughout many, many years of organizing by many groups and many of the kinds of actions that folks on this call have already talked about. And so to find this then choke point that we could elevate this very technical action and have climbers that delayed the ship for 40 hours. And even though, as I mentioned before, that did stop in that moment something from happening. It was also 40 hours where the Arctic was safe from drilling. It was 40 hours that people saw the determination of the activists and also were forced to uncomfortably sit with the irresponsible and destructive behavior of Shell. And it was 40 hours where we were able to use creative tactics to capture the hearts and minds of people across the world and show them what we were fighting for and remind them that they too could have a voice and they too could paint themselves into the story. 
and because of the, of course, the years of campaigning, but Shell pulled out of the Arctic a month after that activity. There's a lot of reasons that direct action and civil disobedience are effective. Thanks, Brewster, I see you. Um, that are effective tactics for change. The actions, for me, the fact that they create discomfort and disruption that jar people out of their day-to-day -day comforts and call for a reaction and for engagement, that these are the qualities that are actually the most powerful and that it is the discomfort itself that forces people to look into what's happening, to see the impact of their behavior, the kinds of actions that call people to acknowledge both the direct impact of the issue, but also how they are complicit in a society if they continue to do nothing. And that those direct actions, those moments of discomfort, force people to grapple with their justifications of an action. It also reminds people that they have a voice and that just because something is uncomfortable doesn't mean that they shouldn't do it. And that disruption alone, especially sustained disruption is sometimes the only thing that moves us, moves the status quo and can shake apathy loose and allow the deep tensions to surface so we can actually address them head on. So with that, I th for me, direct action is the clear message that we shouldn't be afraid or shy away from discomfort to bring about the change and that we need to accept that if we are gonna try to build a society that hasn't yet existed, it's gonna be uncomfortable and it's going to be messy and, and that that's okay. And I just wanna end with um, another example of a banner that we hung um, in January of 2017 after the inauguration of Trump and there was no train and there was no tree and we wanted to do something that would invigorate our movements and send a clear and unmistakable message that we're powerful and not to be silenced. So we chose the word resist and we hung it on a crane behind the White House. And more than it was the word, I think it was the fact that it was painted inside of the rays of a brilliant and rising sun. And from uh, the activists that were on the crane, I had the privilege of walking to the streets and I could hear people talking to each other and asking and talking about what they were resisting and how they felt hopeful and that the hope itself was uncomfortable but that that was the bravery that we were asking in that moment was to have hope and one of the activists from the top of the crane said that the banner was a painted love letter to the movement and that looking forward having to understand that the fight for the future is a interrelated one now, yes, it's all the environment is important, but the future calls on us to understand how racism and patriarchy and environmental degradation are invariably connected and that we have to make space to hear the voices of people who are impacted to follow the lead of the people on the front line and continue to be uncomfortable so that we can make the necessary changes, but also encourage people to have hope and join. And, and join into what is fundamentally uncomfortable, but will fundamentally be the only way that we can uh, build a better world. Thank you, Georgia. Um, I wanna remind people if they have questions to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your page. Um, and Chuck is going to Chuck McKinney will sort those out and he will ask the questions of the speakers. Be sure, please, if you have a question for a specific speaker, put that in the question. And uh, if not, Chuck will direct it to a particular speaker. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, that after our last speaker, we will go back to everybody for an additional three minutes um, to discuss the implications that they see for the of the experience of their sector, their part of history for the situation the country is facing today and in the next few weeks. But the next speaker will specifically talk about the next few weeks. Uh, we're very close to a, let's say, a transcendentally important election. Uh, and exactly what will happen when the results come in is still very much a question mark or a point of debate. And people are preparing for the worst case scenarios. Uh, Stephen Zunes teaches at the University of San Francisco. Stephen. Thank you. Um, these have just been amazing uh, presentations and reminds 
us all of the um, rich history and ongoing struggles in, in the nation and the way that the American people have, have risen up to apply civil resistance, uh, nonviolent direct action uh, in so many uh, creative and courageous and effective ways. We may be up in the next few weeks against a, a, a very serious challenge that, that we may have to once again take to the streets uh, for the defense of, of democracy itself. Are there any number of scenarios, and I could elaborate some of this during the Q&A if people are interested, in ways that Trump uh, you know, might uh, be able to get away with effectively stealing the election uh, and to the point where, you know, with the courts, uh, Republican dominated courts uh, on, on their uh, side, other things, they, they, the only thing that might prevent that would be, uh, you know, massive action by the American public. And in addition to the rich history that we have to draw on in, in terms of, um, of civil resistance in this country, there have been actually several cases where people have risen up when incumbent uh, governments have attempted to um, um, seize power, or, or sorry, may, uh, hold on to power um, after they have uh, uh, been defeated uh, in an election. And so I want to um, look at a few of these. Um, first of all, we have the Philippines in 1986 when the US-backed dictator Ferdinand Marcos, uh, after a, nor a growing massive uh, uh, resistance across the country, agreed to have elections. Uh, Corazon Aquino, the widow of an opposition leader he had assassinated, uh, was the uh, candidate of the opposition. Uh, there were independent, there, there, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of independent uh, uh, voting monitors. And they had a parallel count that showed Corazon Aquino was winning, uh, but uh, it became quite apparent that the, uh, the official government run count was being um, twisted. So that Marcos was declared the winner. Uh, massive resistance, especially following an attempted um, uh, coup by uh, pro-constitutionalist uh, uh, military officers led millions of Filipinos out to the streets and uh, forced uh, the um, uh, uh, dictator to flee into exile in the United States and Cory Aquino be uh, the uh, democratic elected uh, um, opposition uh, candidate uh, indeed was able to assume the presidency. Um, another uh, case uh, took place in Serbia in 2000 uh, Slobodan Milosevic, the uh, so-called uh, butcher of the Balkans, had um, uh, uh, again was was uh, uh, called for a snap election, similar to what Marcos did, hope, hoping that uh, in a short period the opposition wouldn't be able to mobilize. The opposition was strongly divided uh, uh, against each other; they didn't, know, didn't know if they could get a unified candidate. But the um, a student movement known as Otpor uh, had arisen that had been organizing for a number of years. They had been set back when the US bombed the country in uh, uh, 1999. Uh, they, they very much opposed that because it just got people to rally around the flag. But um, when the dust settled for that, they started organizing again. And uh, when uh, um, it looked like the uh, opposition uh, candidate, uh, Tsunicha, was going to, uh, to win, uh, but uh, again, 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 a similar scenario, the uh, count stopped and then it resumed. Uh, it looks like um, it falls short of the majority, requiring a second round, fearing that Milosevic would use that to uh, um, dock the results even further. Again, there was a massive uprising, people massed on the streets, came from all around the country, and it forced um, uh, Milosevic uh, to, to step down. Uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, the uh, incumbent uh, regime, again, like the Marcos and uh, um, uh, Milosevic, uh, you know, uh, governments had um, uh, uh, murdered opposition uh, 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 politicians and journalists of a very, very corrupt uh, regime. Uh, they, again, uh, yeah, they, uh, <clears throat> they tried to steal the election. It was pretty, uh, they, they ob obvious, it was pretty obvious they in, in terms of the, the uh, <clears throat> exit polls uh, showed the opposition a clear winner. Again, massive uh, uprising and the dead of winter, <laughs> which is very cold in Ukraine, um, and uh, the, led the forces of the Supreme Court to get involved, declared the first uh, 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 first election uh, null and void. Uh, they 
they tried again and the opposition candidate again was the, the clear winner who was inaugurated in office. And most recently in, in Gambia, uh, the um, incumbent uh, uh, <clears throat> a president who'd been in power for, for decades uh, lost an election. He initially conceded, uh, but then he reversed, you know, claiming it was fraudulent, he was going to stay in power. And again, a massive uh, uprising uh, emerged and uh, the, that uh, you know, led to uh, uh, an intervention by neighboring uh, African states. Uh, and uh, the, um, the, uh, the initial result was honored. Well, what do we have to learn from, from all these? What, what might be, be relevant? And, and I think if you look at the lessons from these uh, 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 successful uprisings against stolen elections, I see five things in common. One was the meticulous election monitoring and related efforts which enabled the opposition to make a convincing case that there was indeed fraud and there had not been a full and accurate count of the vote. Secondly, mobilization within days of um, that it became apparent that there were efforts underway to um, steal the election, building on networks that oppositions, uh, which had, been mobil uh, had been mobilizing with, with for years. Uh, Large-scale non-cooperation challenging the legitimacy of the incumbent government, including uh, popular contestation of public space. Uh, and um, strict nonviolent um, discipline by the opposition, even in the face of violent repression. And, and finally, the support of both the centrist political grouping whose candidate had been robbed of victory, as well as grassroots elements of civil society to their left. Um, now I wanna talk about um, uh, 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 some about how we might apply this, but we got, there are actually a number of groups that are all mobilizing already around, sorry, uh, around this uh, that are, um, 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 you have Choose Democracy is doing online workshops for possible massive resistance. Hold the Line uh, is has a 53-page manual that talks about what we need to do before, during, and after uh, the election. Uh, Protect the Results is is probably the more mainstream group. Uh, that's the one that involved has Move On and you know, dozens of other prominent uh, uh, progressive and, and civil liberties organizations. But you can get information on, on this and trainings and other things um, if you want to uh, know more about it. Uh, what I what I try what I want to um, uh, uh, use use the rest of my uh, my time with is just talking about the the way th th that um, um, not, what number of things we have to our advantage. Uh, that the other, other, these other countries don't in terms of our, our, our history of, um, of civil resistance and the, um, and the relative of freedoms that we, we have, uh, certainly being challenged uh, more and more. But, um, but there are also some things that are, that are, are, are more difficult. Um, one is that in, in Philippines, Serbia, Ukraine, and, um, um, and, and Gambia, their election systems are like most countries. The, whoever gets the most votes wins. But of course, in our country, we have the Electoral College. Uh, and, it had, and there are also a number of obsc other obscure provisions which could result in Trump being declared the winning winner. Uh, for example, I mean, the Democratic Party is doing, has tons of lawyers and everything, make sure everything's full, uh, free, uh, you know, fully accounted. But it's possible that, again, the federal courts and, and, uh, and, and um, legislatures could you know, push through uh, getting Republican electors, even in situations where the Democrats uh, won. The, um, um, also, we have the problem of, uh, of right-wing militia. I, I, think that, I think it's un, uh, unlikely that um, a, a police and military would, would shoot into unarmed, massive unarmed crowds in this kind of situation, but these right-wing militia uh, are a factor to be uh, con considered. I think we also need to, uh, uh, but, but I think in, in, in general, the idea of, of, um, of disrupting things as much as possible to get the economic elites to realize that uh, but more important than tax cuts that for them, I think is stability. And if we make sure there'll be no business as usual, that there'll be uh, ongoing disruptions until the popular will is, um, um, is honored, is something we need to uh, uh, prepare for. Uh, and because uh, 
this is where our, our power is because ultimately uh, the uh, a government's only as powerful as people's willingness to obey it. And if necessary, we may need to put that to the ultimate test. Thank you, Stephen. So what we're gonna do now, as I said, is go circle back in the same order. Um, since Sahara was first, I was a little quicker to cut her off to not set a bad example for everybody else. So I'm gonna give her an extra minute if she wants to finish up what she was saying, and then she'll have a three minutes to talk about uh, what she sees as the implications from the civil rights movement's experience into the uh, kind of situation that Stephen talked about or her own sense of where we might be going in the next few weeks. Zahara. Thanks, John. Um, I Where I was when uh, I stopped was uh, saying, you know, that we need to agree on our goals together and our objectives. Uh, but I also uh, had wanted to throw in that we must be uh, wary of strangers who show up uh, in our demonstrations and are disruptive uh, or initiate violence. And we know this has happened uh, in our recent demonstrations. And of course, this is used to turn people against uh, what we are striving for, even those people people who initially appreciate it. And needless to say, the uh, menace in the White House uses uh, the uh, disruptions often caused by right-wing uh, provocateurs uh, against us. But also having been an active participant in the movements of the 60s um, I learned a lot. Uh, mainly, I learned about the strength of regular people to change the racist oppressive systems that harm them. Uh, I learned that a well-organized movement, can, what it can do to change systems and laws that need changing under incredible conditions because that's exactly what we did in the South. Uh, I learned that there are grassroots leaders in every community ready to spring into action when encouraged to use their innate skills to organize uh, their communities. And this was the SNCC model for community organizing. Uh, we who were field organizers uh, took our primarily ourselves and a few resources that we uh, put at the people's disposal to bring about the changes we need. And I think this is exactly what we must do now. Uh, and this is what I know the Movement for Black Lives and other groups are doing. And I applaud and join them in this work. Hey, thank you very much. Um, Jay, uh, I'm wondering whether your sense is that, that the part of those of us who were part of the anti-war movement, whether you see us mostly watching from the sides at this point or that we people will become, I'm sure many of us are already working on the election, but may feel impelled to get involved and what your thoughts are about what ought to happen if we're facing an effort to steal the results of the election. Jay, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Can't run over if I'm muted. <laughs> I think that uh, one of the things, that, an important lesson of May Day was how when large numbers of people act together, they exponentially increase their impact, you know, that, and they make it difficult or impossible for the state to fully respond. If 300 people show up in front of the White House, 
uh, it's easy to contain. If 50,000 people uh, surround the White House and sit down even at that point or can create obstructive action, uh, this, the government can't deal with it. And you know, not that they won't try, but I think that that's the kind of, of action that something, I mean, we saw the photographs that Stephen presented and they show you know, the streets and the, the centers of, of the city just filled and overflowing. I mean, what if 10,000 people had responded to Mitch McConnell's efforts to steal Obama's judicial nominations? I was sort of surprised that there wasn't any response to that because it was an unconstitutional action, authoritarian action. And I think that ideally people should begin to see these authoritarian encroachments as reasons to mobilize and to, to create effective action. And again, not token action, but something that can really uh, be effective. Um, you know, so, and I think that to the extent of what our generation does who are active in the war, it's things like this, I guess, partly, but also to be active, but also to try to learn lessons from when, what went before and to take also inspiration and courage. I mean, certainly the civil rights movement um, continues to inspire a lot of people. I mean, the, the recent death of John Lewis showed how powerful that, that action was and continues to resonate. So, um, you know, I think that's what I think. I think the main lesson of May Day is when you have 25 or 35,000 people mobilized, you, you flood the zone and it becomes much more difficult for the state to, con to contain it or ignore it. And I think that part of the, the motivation for May Day was that it was easy to ignore large demonstration. It, be, it got to that point. I think we saw that under Bush. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating against the war in Iraq uh, and many more even internationally, but it didn't have the impact. If, there had, if, if of the 500,000 people that mobilized in New York against the war in Iraq, you know, 100,000 of them or 50,000 of them had just stopped and sat down, it would have made a stronger um, message. I mean, we continue to watch the footage of the Selma march. Um, bold action uh, in, the, in the face of opposition, but, but refusing to back down. Thanks very much. Shahida, um, <laughs> the energy that Black Lives Matter has brought, do you see it merging or being part of this effort to defend democracy in a, another sense, or do you see it largely focused on the inevitable next atrocity to come from a local police force? I think, I mean, for, this is all, also such a weird question, right? Because I think if you, for folks who uh, are unsure of what our platform is, uh, please go to the Movement for Black Lives. It's right there, it's been there since 2016. But um, uh, a lot of the things that we're fighting for are include both a local and a government demand. And so these are not things that are being pushed by either party either, just to be honest, right? So we talk about democracy in the wider sense of being able to vote, your voice counting, being able to have your, uh, you know, be represented. That fight, whether it's Republican or Democratic is always a thing that we're fighting for in our local communities as black folks, as brown folks, as poor folks, right? And so that fight continues for us regardless of who is in office. Nobody who would get elected in this election uh, nationally is pro-reparations, for example, or pushing an invest, divest framework, or pushing demilitarization. Um, uh, so I think uh, for me, that means that we, and, and that's one of the reasons why trainings and supplies and, you know, for us, it's an ongoing process because we're always both looking at what we have to respond to on the local level and a necessary need for us to respond on the national level. And then there are times when um, it makes sense for us to merge with national uh, groups and stand in alignment for the defense of a government that allows or has the promise of that. And so I think that there are ways uh, that we can and would participate in this. But I think it, one of the things that I think is often a fallacy, <coughs> 
or a thing that's not maybe not a fallacy one of the things that's not often discussed though is the fact that uh many times what we have been fighting for moves to the back burner right when we start talking about this larger scope of democracy and we and even in the anti-war movement right we saw the war kind of take over in many spaces where folks had been and, and become an emphasis where there was still you know what many people felt was a de-emphasis on this, the the still continued need for civil rights moving forward, and so I think that there's a there's a way that there is some internal conflict in it, and some ways in which we would need to be actively working to make sure that what moves to the forefront in uh, reestablishing a White House is not for us to continue moderate conservative uh, demands that still leave Black and Brown communities needs on the back burner. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's my response. No, no, I, I think it, it's very crucial to mention um, that both the specific and the, and the broader are of concern and that the broader should not overcome the specific in the course of the struggle that goes forward. As, as has come up in earlier other discussions among the planning group is the, the fact that while right now we're focused on making sure that Donald Trump is not the next president, there is then a whole series of questions about how we ought to prepare uh, if Joe Biden is elected and Kamala Harris are elected, uh, how do we prepare to get our own agendas uh, addressed in a way that all of the pressures in Washington will be moving against, especially there sense of crisis and, and the problems that they're going to think of as priority problems. So it's, it's very appropriate to and remind I think us. You say that getting Trump out of office doesn't move or remove fascism, racism, or the group of folks that have championed him. Like they don't just automatically right. go away because it's no, not Exactly. Possible. Yeah, no. We're, and I think we may see them in some very unpleasant ways. Somebody asked in the chat, nobody's talked about the problem of the militias and the QAnons and, and the, uh, the real danger of violence. Uh, Stephen talked about it a little bit, but maybe that can come back. So Sarah, uh, do you want to join the conversation from the perspective of uh, the struggles that you were talking about? Again, the somewhat a parallel question to Shahida, though, uh, the extent to which the concerns that motivated women, contemporary women's movement and welfare rights uh, and the gay struggles, how much that gets involved in, in the energies that may have to be mobilized. Yeah, um, I mean, I, well, the first thing I'll say is just to echo what some other panelists have said about, um, at least in DC, a group that I've been organizing with called Shutdown DC has been trying to prepare people to become familiar and comfortable with the idea of nonviolent direct action of taking to the streets and being prepared to stay in the streets if the election um, does go the way that many people seem to think it's going to go though hope that it doesn't of course and so one thing that i would just reiterate is the importance of starting training people i mean we've been doing trainings for months now of preparing people to get them in the mindset of taking the uncomfortable actions that georgia was mentioning um, and i think that that is such a key factor and key um, step in making sure that there are going to be the kinds of numbers that Jay is saying are necessary to actually make it hard for the state to respond. Um, so I think that's one key step, regardless of which sort of movement one is coming from. The in terms of you know gender and sexuality, I think that it really depends on how you're approaching those issues. I think that there are people who um, see 
Biden and Harris in some ways as friendlier candidates to women's rights and LGBT rights. But I think that's only if you're looking at those rights from kind of a, a perspective of liberal inclusion that doesn't upset the status quo too much and doesn't demand more of um, the immense economic and racial and gender inequality that currently define life in the US for so many um, both women and gender nonconforming and LGBTQ people. So they, I think that it, you know, you can sort of have a, um, for lack of a better word, liberal feminist assessment of those candidates being friendlier, but how much they will change conditions for uh, the most marginalized within gender and LGBT groups, I think is uh, not as inspiring uh, for many movements that are demanding uh, movement on police brutality, on global warming, on economic equality and the violence of capitalism, uh, on the continued devaluation of reproductive labor. I think that those issues are going to continue to be front and center, even if um, Trump does somehow, uh, whether by some miracle of his own volition leave or is forced out by the people. Thank you. Ken. Um, the labor questions that you focused on were what I would say would be the new labor in the sense, the uh, immigrant minority um, struggles that have been part of our recent history. You didn't talk so much about the older history, the Flint strike or sit-in strike and other things. And, and I bring that up because I think the question is what we're seeing, going to see this to some extent in the election, what happens in Michigan and other Pennsylvania and other states that have traditional industrial working class uh, bases. Um, question, but I, those of us who lived, who were part of the anti-war movement remember Nixon's success in mobilizing the hard hats uh, to attack anti-war activists in New York. The question is with, in part is, do you see both the more recent labor activism becoming part of resistance to a threat to democracy? Do you see any a hope that the older labor movement might become involved because of its Democratic Party orientation? Currently, the reality is that unions only represent 11% of the US working class. And if you look at where the energy, the motion, the mobilization is occurring, it is among low wage workers, it is among immigrant workers, workers of color. I think the critical challenge moving forward is how do we bring together an economic justice movement and a racial justice movement? Uh, we have uh, the pandemic profiteers. We have billionaires who have made obscene profits in the last few months. Uh, we have uh, many more workers of color who are uh, essential workers who are being poisoned uh, by the COVID-19 vi uh, virus. We see mortality rates higher uh, in communities of color. We see uh, young workers who um, are, uh, are locked out of the opportunities of having a sustainable uh, income uh, for the future and are in these um, low wage gig jobs uh, that have no future. Uh, we have uh, a situation where young workers are much more open to uh, unions than they have been in many years. Uh, and so uh, we need to build a new labor movement that is very much uh, one that embraces social justice, nonviolence, uh, that very much uh, sees the link between um, economic justice and racial justice. The fact that there have been over 700 cities where the movement for Black Lives has uh, taken root is powerful. And uh, you know these are led by, in many instances, young workers. So uh, let's let's find ways of bringing together a uh, economic justice and a racial justice movement that will help to transform the society, and that can uh, make sure that uh, Trump and those that support him uh, are uh, pushed aside. Thank you, Georgia. My son works for an orga environmental organization. One of our sons. 
in which they can't talk about the politics of the country because of their the base of their membership. Um, so I don't expect a lot of their members are gonna be part of a resistance movement. I'm wondering what your sense is of the, of the more activist pieces of the environmental movement, Greenpeace, the Sunrise Movement and others, uh, and how much they see uh, protecting us from what the administ Trump administration has done to national parks and everything else um, how much that's going to motivate them to be part of a resistance? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think um, to echo a bit of what Kent said, I think where we really need to move the environmental justice, the environmental movement and anyone who identifies as part of that is for, for a people to really understand that there is no environmental justice without racial justice, without labor justice, without economic justice, that we can't actually separate those movements. And so I think as that relates to the way that we are building social movements, this, um, I had one of my mentors tell me once that politeness was one of the most insidious aspects of white supremacy because it, it teaches people to not discuss things that are uncomfortable and that we need uh, for your son or anyone who works in the environmental movement to make those bridges to have help people understand that you know, we can't live in a sustainable world unless we first deal with the people who are being most oppressed um, and that you can't have environmentalism without, like I said, without racial justice, without economic justice, that you can't actually separate them. And so I think where the where that comes to how we organize in this moment is being really explicit about those connections and having those uncomfortable conversations. And I think it is the responsibility of organizations like Greenpeace, uh, like the Sierra Club, people who can talk to their own folks about what is what is necessary in this moment uh, to, to build a better world. Check. Great, thank you. So um, just a two housekeeping things before we go to the questions. We still held most, oh, I'm sorry, Stephen, I, you're right. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. So just, just, just a couple of brief thoughts. So, you know, one is that it's important to, uh, I mean, I, I, I should mention that I've been an outspoken critic of Biden. I've written at least a half dozen articles, um, <clears throat> uh, highly critical of his uh, foreign policy positions. Uh, for example, I live in a, uh, I live in California, not a swing state. I'm planning to vote for the Green Party. <laughs> um, so I'm encouraging people in swing states to vote Biden. Um, and, and I'm saying that only because it's important to recognize uh, that uh, uh, Cory Aquino, um, and as well as Yashinko, Kuznicza, Barrow, the opposition uh, candidates I mentioned that uh, people power thrust uh, into their rightful election victory, they were decidedly centrist. The partial exception of Aquino, they were not charismatic. Uh, people on the left were grumbling about them as much as we've been grumbling about Biden, but they recognized this was not, uh, these, 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 uh, this outpouring was to save democracy. It was not about, um, about, not about supporting a particular uh, candidate. And uh, I, I think that, and, and indeed, what, what's exciting about this, uh, uh, let's say we do have to take the streets uh, to, to, to defeat Trump and enable Biden to become president, you know, he's going to owe his presidency to mass movements. We will have millions of people who have been mobilized in nonviolent direct action for the first time ever. And that's an empowering thing that we can then apply to work on the more radical changes. Because if you look at places like Latin, Latin America, I mean, if you look at the dozens of countries where dictatorships have been overthrown through nonviolent action, I mean, a lot of my fellow leftists say, oh, those are just liberal revolutions. I said, yeah, yeah, but being, being, at least being liberal, you can organize without fear of the secret police coming in in the middle of the night. You can empower women's groups, peasants, peasant leagues, the progressive church, uh, 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 various uh, you know, minorities, student groups, uh, labor unions, other people who were, were, would have political space to mobilize. And that's what's, that's what's really important. And, and also, I just also want to emphasize that none of these movements that I looked at were explicitly pacifist. These were not Gandhian or Kingian nonviolence. These people chose nonviolent action because it was they saw it as most effective, and and again the, the key one of the key variables is numbers. 
you're not going to bring your family or a lot of people aren't going to bring themselves if they know there are going to be a bunch of people throwing rocks and bottles at police who are going to then use that as justification to 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 to, to go back at people i don't have any moral judgment moral judgment against you know a, a, a people who who, 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 are, who, are, who are violent, it's just on a pragmatic level. So, in fact, when people ask me, is this tactic violent or that tactic violence? I don't uh, how do you define it? I don't care what you call it. Does it help the movement or does it hurt the movement? And, you know, some, some cre creative uh, vandalism of uh, Confederate statues, I mean, I, I think that, that moves things forward, I think. But again, smashing random windows, throwing things at cops, no, it doesn't, it hurts. And so we just need to be smart. We need to be strategic, not moralistic, just smart and strategic. And that, uh, and, and that strongly underscores the idea of keeping a, a nonviolent discipline. Thank you. All right, we have 19 questions. Sorry both to have been rude and kind of not recognizing you, but also I think your comments were excellent uh, wrapping up of some earlier discussion. And I'm sure there will we'll get more of that coming back in the questions. Chuck, or I see just your name there, so you're there. Okay, I'm not sure whatever happened to Carol, we seem to have lost her in this process, but um, if uh, you can now pick out some of the questions we've gone, it's now 5.54, I wanna give it about another 15 minutes, um, unless it just seems totally impossible to stop. So. Uh, and let me say also that we will, uh, people have asked this on the chat, I will copy the chat and it will be posted in the, uh, on that information page that I've provided the link for. So Chuck, it's, go ahead, please. All right, thanks. Um, can, can everybody hear me all right? All right, excellent. So um, thank you all. Thanks to the panelists for some um, some great observations, great opening remarks, as well as um, follow-up comments. You all have given us a lot to talk about. Um, there's lots of questions. And so what I've been doing is going through the questions and trying to sort of group them so that we'll have a, a general sense of what, um, so we can, so, so I'll ask a representative question from a, a host of questions so that we can knock around. All right. Um, I'll come back up here and start with um, so one of the questions, and this could be for everybody, is how can current direct action movements for fundamental change avoid the pitfall of being co-opted by established organizations, nonprofit and industrial complex connected to big foundations and the Democratic Party and or socially responsible corporations with the goal to temper, temper demands and strategies. So again, how can we avoid, um, how can we avoid being co-opted um, by, by interests that are less that don't necessarily converge with the core interests of the constituencies we represent. And that's for anybody. I'd like to chime in on that one. For me, I don't think it, it's, uh, I don't necessarily see that as my responsibility. I see it as the representative of folks who claim to support what we have decided as our platform. Um, I want to note that liberalism and progressive right and even leftist right is not the same as supporting the movement for black lives and the, and what we have identified as um, what we want to see moving forward. That being said, I think that it means that when you are looking to support somebody because you are in support of a Black Lives Matter movement or you are in support of uprisings that name specifically Black Lives Matter or the movement for Black Lives, that you support leadership of those groups, that people that you ask to speak have been vetted as part of those groups, that you support the grassroots organizations, not 501c3s who name that and that is not their work, right? And I think that it holds you accountable to being to 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 actually finding out about the organizations behind. And so again, the reason most folks are fooled or led astray, bamboozled, all the things, right? Is because many of them only think about or hear about the movement through mass media spaces. And they never actually engage with the local organizations, with the grassroots organizations that are moving the work on the ground. And that's where they get most of their information. And therefore, and, and again, grassroots organizations do not have the ability to have access to mass platforms like CNN, et cetera. We don't have the ability to pay for 
uh, commercials and ads through social media in the same way. And so you have to look and vet. And I think that onus is actually on the people who claim to support those specific movements and work. Chuck, so wanna move on to the next, okay? All right, uh, let's see here. Um, so there's a lot of concern in, that's been expressed in the chat about what um, what organizations and inst what word organizations can do um, around the election, right? A lot of concern about um, uh, the, the the peaceful transfer of power, and so um, so there's a number of questions about what sorts of what what advice or insights do you all have um, around. Uh, around the, piece, the transfer of power in the elections. What sorts of things should we be preparing for? Um, what does that preparation look like? Um, how, do, how should we be thinking about this movement sort of organizationally and tactically? And that's again for everybody. Somebody want to come in on that? Jay, Georgia, Stephen, Zahara. I want to move it around a bit so one of you Well, I just want to say that Stephen, in his uh, presentation, certainly talked about the and gave us links to the groups that are working on this. So people are really working on it. And, you know, the one on the top was Choose Democracy, et cetera. So those uh, groups should be looked into. And in your local areas, you should plug into those. So. I'm happy that a lot of very uh, talented and experienced people are organizing these groups in preparation for the planned coup by Trump and the Republicans. And let, let me also just mention that um, in, ter in terms of establishment organizations that might not be willing to support a mass disruption I think we can, we, the, the, you know, the, the slogan says, you know, the people lead, the leaders will follow. My big concern is that if Trump figures out a way, uh, a way of legally winning, you know, by getting the <clears throat> getting state legislators to sign Republican delegates, uh, electors, even when, when uh, and, and not count the absentee ballots or the various scenarios we've all been reading about and worrying about, you know, that some, that we may have to have to have to, uh, you know, take take the lead that, you know, is Biden the kind of person who would lead a, a, an insurrection? I don't think so. But if it's an insurrection underway already, um, he may be willing to ride the crest of it. And so I, I, I think um, it, it's important that we we we, we keep the uh, keep keep the initiative. And sometimes, for example, we could you know force uh, you know companies, uh, you know uh, 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 corporations to to join the join a general strike, for example, by you know, by by shutting them down in, in, in various ways. I mean there. All, all, we could, we could, uh, you know, force governors in key states like New York and California, which control 25 percent of the gross national product of the country, to um, to join the strike. You know, even if the National Democratic Party isn't. I mean, we, I, I and think of all sorts of scenarios. But but the thing is, let's not, not let's let's not rely on the more establishment kind of organizations uh, to lead this. So this needs to be a, a, a people's movement. Yeah, Jay. I mean, I guess one question will be how a call is communicated. I mean, if there is to be, you know, a convergence, for example, on Washington, um, people need to know about it. And people ideally need to form affinity groups and be able to, you know, go knowing that they have some uh, plan of action where there will be support mechanisms and that kind of thing. So, I mean, presumably, if, if we come to this, there will be some kind of people will be issuing that call, we'll know about it. Am I right in thinking that, Stephen? I, 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 sorry, I didn't quite. I'm just saying, if 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 there is a, a need for action, are people going to know about it? Is there going to be a yeah, call? Yes, yes. I, I I think things will coalesce. I don't know how what's going to look like, um, but uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of in, 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 in a number of these uh, these uprisings, you know, while there was some coordination from the top, there's also a lot of really amazing creative, spontaneous actions, and things kind of came to get come together. I'm not on, I'm not, I'm not part of any of those three organizations. I, 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 um, I posted about, but um, it is something we, we obviously need, we, we obviously need to think about, and not be working across purposes. Right. Yeah. Has Black Lives Matter thought about this, Shay? I mean, had any discussions that you're aware of? 
Yes. We've had lots of discussions. Black Lives Matter movement for Black Lives have had lots of discussions. Okay. About contingencies, about making how decisions get made and how to activate people. Is that a question? Are yeah, you I was, it, it wasn't <laughs> clear what you were saying about what kinds of discussions you were having. So I was asking. Oh, I mean, this was, yeah, the question specifically I thought was, has Black Lives Matter been having specific discussions about this topic? Ab about this yeah. topic. Okay, that's all right. Yeah. That was implied to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the examples that we don't want to repeat is the Al Gore example. Exactly. Uh, which I think had he challenge the results, exactly. um, history would have been different because he would yeah. have been able to mobilize people. At any rate, so that's my bad example. To The other things, thing that I think is obviously it's gonna be activists. George is at the airport and it looks like she's probably got a, her plane being called, but uh, uh, activists are going to start the process, but they have to do it I think with Steven said they have to do it, we have to do it in a way that makes it possible for or forces the people more towards the center or the liberal center to come with us rather than have excuses for not coming with us. So I think that's the always the crucial dynamic. Um, do you have another I question? Just, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to, I'm sorry, you're leaving, was that? Uh, uh, I don't know if I George is leaving or not. We've lost two people already. So okay. Uh, I just wanted to add to uh, Jay, not only should people be thinking of mobilizing in DC and New York, but in all of our cities, we need people in the streets uh, so that the, the whole country, uh, we have thousands in the streets uh, saying no way. So it's not just, you know, DC, right. New York, LA, San Francisco, but even down here in Gainesville, Florida, where I am, you know, we're talking about being in the streets. Yeah. Georgia, do you want to say something before you go to get the plane? Sure. Um, and thanks again for having me. I really appreciate the conversation. I think that uh, what is really important is that every every community across the country there are local organizers and local groups that are doing important work that people should plug into and I, and I know I said it before but I think one of the things that we need to really encourage people to do is to have the uncomfortable conversations to hold their families and their friends accountable and not just go to the street but go to the street with their communities to keep their folks in check to bring up difficult conversations around fascism around race around injustice and if everybody is holding each other accountable to that, we will see more people in the streets rather than just kind of continuing the same folks that um, have been having. So really thinking about how to spread out. Okay, um, Chuck, but, we have added two questions. <laughs> Do you want to try and pick out the one or two most salient to raise? And we'll sure. Um, so there's a, been a couple of questions. Um, I've, I've been looking at the chat, but also in the, uh, the questions. And um, one of the questions that folks have have asked a couple of times, right, is um, this is the question about nonviolence, right, and nonviolence as a tactic, and what does that look like in the face of um, openly armed, um, openly armed insurrection, right? What does that look like in the face of roving bands of white nationalists and Klansmen um, and and other you know and other forces of fascism? Um, openly, you know, openly carrying arms and threatening, uh, threatening force and threatening violence. So what's, so what is, so what should our response be sort of, you know, ideologically and, and tactically um, in, in the face of that very real possibility uh, in the days to come and not just in the election, but in the days to come period. So what are your thoughts on that panel? Small question. <laughs> Well, I, 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 let's remember that we have, there's a there, there with the, the civil rights struggle knew about right wing militia. Hundreds of people died. Now, I mean, we heard about we heard about uh, you know um, Goodman and Schwerner because they were white boys, and we heard about some of the other white, but but yeah, there are people. A lot of people died, and um, 
Yet, you know, people, but people recognized that, you know, the, it was the, it meant, meant the nonviolent discipline was all the more important because, um, you know, re resisting that with, 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 with guns uh, would, would just uh, lead to slaughter. It would justify more, uh, even more uh, repression, especially since so much of this whole thing was justified like it is today in terms of uh, law and order. Um, and remember, there are people who, I mean, I, I just got in January just before COVID, I was in Sudan and where they had an amazing nonviolent movement. They were up against the Janjaweed. They were against these genocidal militia. And yet people, both through smart tactics of uh, decentralizing the, the, the protests where appropriate and, 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 um, and, and, doing, and, 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 and uh, uh, using a lot of different creative tactics, as well as sheer tenacity and bravery, show that they could, they could, they could even uh, overcome a, a, well, a literally genocidal regime. And so, you know, there, there'd be people who've, who've been, you know, up against a, a lot more, you know, violence, both by the state and by uh, armed groups, and we have, who've nevertheless, you know, been able to, uh, uh, been, been able to win. And so I, 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 I throw that out just because it is something scary that we should, should be aware of, but it's not, it's not, doesn't mean that we can't overcome it. I, I, I just wanted to say that we also need to know that in the South, we had the Deacons for Defense, uh, and we had other groups protecting us, uh, movement people. Uh, so it's one thing if you're talking about the state, uh, it's another thing in my view and in my experience, if you're talking about uh, militias uh, uh, who are not state authorized uh, and whether or not uh, people can have groups that protect communities from marauders. Uh, and we certainly did have that uh, in Mississippi, in Louisiana, in Georgia and places. And thank goodness there are new books that have come out, one by my SNCC uh, comrade, Charlie Cobb, uh, who has written a book that nonviolence will get you killed. So I'm in no way suggesting that we not have disciplined, nonviolent demonstrations and civil disobedience. But when it comes to marauders coming into our communities and attempting to kill and maim and burn, we might want to think about how we organize to protect ourselves from them. And I just want to add this, like this, this topic really, <laughs> really upsets me because uh, one, the Black Panther Party founded as self-defense and their, their purpose for arming was to monitor the police, right? So they were directly pushing back against the police and use of guns and holding guns and training of guns was part of that tactic, right? It was to show that it was a tool and that they used a wide variety of other tactics, right? Um, so I do want to mention that again, there, there are not any people that don't talk about owning guns, defending their homes, right? Like Fannie Lou Mane, uh, Hamer said that she kept a, a shotgun by her bed. Harriet Tubman had a gun. Like this, this, this to me, it's a, you know, a whitewashing of what has been true of folks' experiences. And I think about me personally, <coughs> I think about, um, it was mentioned earlier about throwing rocks and things at police officers. So I want to preface that, that oftentimes, like locally, we saw that happen after police rolled down and shot a young man over 20 times, forced people into their homes, forced people who had nothing to do with it into their homes. And when they came out in response, they were tear gassed and they threw rocks in response to that. And what was highlighted was the brutality of the protesters, the we need to keep it nonviolent. And again, like I said in my presentation, that the onus is always on the protesters and the violence that is experienced, that you experience as an activist, that you experience, your, how your life is threatened, is always moved to the forefront. It's like, oh my God, we've seen people do this, but you don't live the life you know, you are not being directly attacked at peaceful quote unquote protests where police are dragging people on the ground. And a lot of people die in peaceful protests. 
So to continue saying that the onus of nonviolence or that the violence that has occurred somehow is not directed at protesters and that it is always our responsibility to respond to that in an inhuman way, right? Without anger, without the ability to defend ourselves, I think is one, again, Trump is very traumatic. I think, again, it is a whitewashing of history. I think it is not true to our experiences. And I think it limits how, I think it also plays in to a narrative that says they can't really be about this if they don't do it like this. Perfect protests, perfect ways to show up, perfect humanity. The myth of black excellence is the only reason or way that we get or deserve our rights and our privileges. And I'm okay. Chuck, do you have a different question, different direction from the questions that we ought to end up with, or are we have we covered most everything? I think we've covered just about everything in the um, in the in the Q and A. Um, all of the questions that I'm getting now are just sort of repeats, essentially, of the questions that we've already uh, that we've already nailed down. Okay. So I think all right. we're, pretty, we're Great. done with the questions. All right. Well, as I said. At the beginning, uh, all of this will go up on YouTube. Everybody will get the link to it. We will copy all of the chat and we will put that up uh, in on the blog page. Um, and you'll have those links. Uh, the links to the two major coalitions are already on the blog. And I noticed in one of the chat posts that there is uh, African American parallel group, or that seems to be holding a an event sometime in the next few days, uh, and I don't know who those folks are. So maybe if if Shay and Zahara Chuck, if you could look at it and give us some guidance about who those folks are and and how we should present it. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say, of course, is thank you to everyone. We have lost several of the speakers. Uh, we did lose the ability to do the breakout rooms. We will do that again um, in, in a different way, but everybody will be informed of, which is that we will create meeting rooms around all of the speakers uh, with the moderators, and you will be able to have bring up your questions and comments and with a very focus on that particular uh, constituency uh, theme or uh, part of the struggle. Um, the only other piece that I wanna say personally, Zahara touched on it a little bit. One of the lessons we learned is that some of the people amongst us who tell us that they really are committed and they just want to push things to a ser more serious level have turned out to actually not be with us, but have been agents of the police uh, or of some intelligence operation or of some right-wing operation that's been intended to discredit us. Um, it's notable that in Minneapolis, the first window was broken by somebody who is associated with one of the uh, militia groups. And that didn't determine what happened in Minneapolis thereafter, but it certainly contributed to a dimension that hurt what people were struggling for. So we just somehow this, what Shay and others have talked about of not under, stating the reasons for the anger and the expression of the anger has to be within a political context figured out that that is authentic coming from who we are and not somebody trying to manipulate us. I mean, if they've been able to create out of nothing QAnon, I mean, QAnon has been created out of the internet and there are people now, if you've watched any of the interviews in the last couple of days, who live in such a different world, <laughs> it's very hard to know how we communicate with them and how we then have a society that integrates them. But obviously we have to, 
or we're going to be in civil war for the next 20 years. So on that happy note, I was thinking <laughs> that we may want to do another of these after the election if it's been relatively stable and Biden is moving into through transition in a way that is a reasonable traditional American way that we may want to discuss again what the agenda is as it applies to that situation. So thank you for everybody very much. And uh, if I hope that everyone will be able to be part of the, the follow on discussions. So any last thoughts before I shut it down? I'm, takes me a second to make sure I've copied all of the the chat. We got a lot of chat comments. I don't know if, yes. I, mean, I certainly haven't been following them. I don't know if, if other people have been able to, but just uh, uh, copying all of them. Yes, Jay, go ahead. I mean, one person, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, one person asked, you know, how about small towns and whether we should all focus on Washington? And of course, that's a good question and something that in May Day, of course, the, the strength was the, the affinity groups at the local level. And I would argue that part of what we need to do going forward, regardless of what happens, is to strengthen our own local communities and to create, you know, real physical interactions and bring together multiracial, multicultural coalitions locally that can have dance parties and barbecues and teach-ins and, and really begin to fortify in our own communities where we have strength, where we have connection and where we can respond when we need to. Great, thank you very much. A nice place to end. And uh, if we hope that people will join us on Friday for the Chicago 7, the discussion of what happened in the convention demonstrations, what happened in the trial, and what people think about the Netflix film. We hope people have had a chance to look at it before then. Uh, and uh, as I say, we will be, I'll be in touch to set up these uh, follow-on uh, meeting groups. And thank you again. And Che, we hope your health <laughs> that you become a good example, even though you lacked all the special treatment that uh, the Mr. Trump received. <laughs> but uh, you're, she we, had need, COVID? we need you. <laughs> so, Did she have COVID? Yes, oh yeah, you oh. missed, yeah, yeah, she's yeah, just wow. come out of the hospital. So, oh my God. She, so she is uh, carrying the several challenges at the moment, so. You're cheering anyway. for you. Chuck, thank you very much for handling the questions uh, and uh, we'll be in touch with everybody. Take care. Thanks everybody. Thanks John. Yep.